Today's the next lesson in our series about how God views politics. It's honestly been one of the more timely series I think I've ever preached, and it seems to have been as received as that as well. So today's lesson, how do you make sense of the mess that you find yourself in? You see, it's not the events in life that make us crazy, but the meaning that we attach to them. What does this mean? What's it mean for me? What's it mean for my future? What's it mean for my family? What does this mean for my church? And of course, what does this mean for my finances? It's really frustrating to us when God doesn't make sense to us. We think we've got God all figured out, but then something happens that blows up in our face, and it makes us question not just about the event, but it makes us question, what's God doing in all this? There's a classic example, of course, of Job, who can only take so much in his life before, like us, he just wants God to explain himself. And in Job 38, the first couple of verses, God does just that. He responds like this to Job, Who are you to speak words without knowledge? The Lord spoke to Job out of a storm, and he said, Who do you think you are to disagree with my plans? You do not know what you're talking about. You see, Job was struggling to understand the mess in his life because, honestly, he was struggling to understand God in his life. So how do you make sense of the mess? Well, the first thing I think is important to see from Joshua's story is that God cares more about character than he does about outcome. And that's true whether you're talking about the mess of an election, the mess of a country, the mess that we create for ourselves and our families, or anything else. God cares more about our character than about the outcome. The problem is we get so caught up in trying to win that we justify the sin. And there is no example greater than that of the, than the last argument that you had with your spouse. We get so obsessed about winning the argument that we somehow justify how sinfully we allow ourselves to act during the middle of the argument. I guess you'd have to quote the infamous Ricky Bobby, right? If you ain't first, you're last to understand that kind of mentality. But more than that, you see and are reminded of what God told Joshua in chapter 1, verse 7. Over and over and over, he reminds him, be strong and courageous. Be sure to obey all the teachings that my servant Moses gave you, and if you follow them exactly, you will be successful in everything you do. Now that was the challenge he gave him, the encouragement he gave him, call it whatever you want, that's, that's just how God told Joshua life is going to work best. You can imagine what happens then a few chapters later in Joshua, in chapter 7, verse 1, when you've got this scenario that plays out. They attack Jericho. The city falls. Everything's going well, except for this. The Lord had said that everything in Jericho belonged to him. But Achan, a man from Judah's tribe, took some of the things from Jericho for himself. And so the Lord was angry with the Israelites because one of them had disobeyed him. You see, we get so caught up in political outcomes that we forget spiritual outlooks as well. Now, it may or may not have been political for Achan. It maybe was more financial. But the bottom line is, we all tend to get caught up in the outcome and forget the impact that it has on us spiritually. For example, in 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 9, God had sent his people into the promised land, the land of Canaan. And he had told them, you have to listen to Moses. You have to listen to what I've told him about how to live your life. But eventually, over time, here's the conclusion of what happened. The people refused to listen. And Manasseh, their king, led them to do even more evil than the pagan nations that the Lord had destroyed when the people of Israel had entered into the land. You see, corruption is not a political issue, it's a spiritual issue. 
It's why the most godly people during Jesus' time became the most indignant people who cried out, crucify him, crucify him. We only see what's wrong when other people do it instead of us. We go to the polls to vote for change because clearly those idiots don't know what they're doing, so we need to replace them with somebody else. The funny thing is, just like we go to the polls to vote for change, it doesn't seem to register to us that we need to go to church to be challenged to change who we are. Jesus' opinion on that in Luke chapter 6 was this, why do you notice the speck in your brother's eye but fail to see the log that's in your own eyes? I'm telling you, people are more upset about absentee ballots right now in this country than they are about absentee members in our churches. And that doesn't look like it's anything that's going to change in the near future. According to one recent research study that was performed, the majority of churches are looking at about a 30, 36% return in their post-COVID attendance. Let me just break that down a little bit for you, just to help that register to you. Whatever your attendance at your church was at the beginning of the year after Christmas, you're looking at about 36% of that compared to what it was. So if you were 300 beforehand, now you're probably about 100, more or less. The other part of that, though, is that it really doesn't seem to have anything to do with the COVID virus itself. For them, it's not a health issue. For them, it's a self issue. That's pretty good. I should have written that down. Nearly 60% of those in the 20 to 40 age group indicated that they would prefer not to gather for in-person worship even after the COVID virus is dealt with, whether it's by vaccine or just because God said, poof, it's gone. 60% would prefer not to gather for in-person worship. Like I said, that's not a health issue. That's a self issue. So how do you make sense of this mess? Well, the second thing is that God will let you fail so that he can save you. You learn more from your failures than you do from your successes. Very few successes lead people to become more Christ-like. And that's primarily because unchecked pride is what takes us further away from God. That's what happened with Satan, right? It was his unchecked pride that made Satan who he is. In Joshua chapter 7, verse 2 and 3, it says, Joshua sent some of his men from Jericho to spy out the town of Ai, east of Bethel, near beth Aven. And when they returned, they told Joshua, there's no need for all of us to go up there. It won't take more than two or 3,000 men to attack Ai. And since there are so few of them, why make all of our people struggle to go up there? Now, one of the reasons why they would say that is because they had just overcome Jericho and had a great victory there. Jericho is in a valley, a valley that's about 800 feet below sea level. Ai, on the other hand, was up in the hill country. That city was about 2,500 feet above sea level. Now, you're not talking just about all of the people going up to attack, but you're also talking about carrying the Ark of the Covenant up there. And so no wonder it just made sense to them. Why send everybody up? Let's just send a couple 3,000 up and that should be good enough. And so in verse 4 and 5, it says approximately 3,000 warriors were sent, but they were soundly defeated. The men of Ai chased the Israelites from the town gate as far as the, the quarries, and they killed 36 of those who were retreating down the slope. The result of that was the Israelites were paralyzed with fear, and their courage melted away. You'll see there that there are three critical mistakes that generally tend to lead to failure, not just with Joshua and his people, but in our own lives as well. The first one being arrogance. I 
that arrogance didn't work out too well for Hillary, who thought she could just not go out and campaign in 2016 and still be handed the keys to the White House. And there will be quite a few that say that it was Trump's arrogance, in spite of the fact that he did go out and campaign, but it was his arrogant way of communicating that led people to hold their nose and vote for somebody else other than him. If only we as Christians would invest an equal amount of energy into church as we do politics. I mean, there are folks who follow every tweet and forward every tidbit of information. But they have yet to forward a link to the sermon series. I hear it's been pretty good. Proverbs 16 verse 18 says, Pride precedes destruction, but an arrogant spirit goes before a fall. There's probably no better example, right, than what we've seen happen politically around us in the last few weeks. Nations around the world are watching in disbelief and, and just looking at each other with their eyes blinking and their mouth hanging open, saying, what's their problem? They need to get it together. They look to America to lead the way forward, and instead, we're leading the way downhill. Part of that, too, is because of a second critical mistake that we made that leads to failure. We choose the easy way out. Like I said, Jericho sits about 800 feet below sea level. AI is uphill about 2,500 feet above sea level. Why make everybody trudge all the way up to the hill and then fight a battle? I mean, after all, we just got done walking around the city of Jericho for the last week. And on the last day, we walked around that same city seven times. I can just hear a bunch of soldiers sitting there grumbling under their breath. This is stupid. This doesn't make any sense. Kind of like what the conversations are like in my household. The right thing is rarely the easy thing. Jesus would say it like this in Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. You can enter true life only through the narrow gate. The gate to hell is very wide, and there's plenty of room on the road that leads there. And many people go that way. Just a comment here, uh, something about the majority rule, that might not always be a good decision. But the gate that opens the way to true life is narrow, and the road that leads there is hard to follow. And there's only a few people that find it. A third critical mistake that leads to failure happens when we ignore the Word of God. Our own pride and arrogance that chooses the easy way out instead of listening and obeying the Word of God. Joshua won his first battle and he didn't think he'd ever lose again. The bigger the decision, the more we need God's guidance. The worst thing that we can do is decide to just go with our gut instead of going with God. So how do you make sense of the mess we get ourselves into? Well, a third thing to consider is that God uses the unexpected and undesired events in our life to help us overcome unhealthy routines, attitudes, behaviors. Illustrations? What kind of tantrum do you throw when the unexpected and undesirable happens to you while you're driving? like the guy that got his driver's license out of the Cracker Jack box and doesn't know how to yield on the entry ramp to the highway. But that's just me. Joshua chapter 7 verse 6 says that he and the leaders of Israel tore their clothes and put dirt on their heads to show their sorrow. They lay face down on the ground in front of the ark of the Lord until sunset. They're all about taking God seriously when things are falling apart. But when things were going well, like the walls of Jericho fell and it was a great victory that day, yay, we got this, we know what we're doing, we're an invincible army, nobody can stop us. But were they really taking God seriously? Or were they just throwing a temper tantrum? You see, God wants me to be aware of my emotions, but he doesn't want me to be controlled by them. Galatians 5, when talking about the fruits of the Spirit, say that self-control is an indication of the presence of God's Spirit in my life. So when, when everything blows up in our face and we feel like everything's a mess, 
God can use those unexpected and undesired events in our life to help me overcome some unhealthy behavior. But he can also use those unexpected, undesirable events in life to help me overcome some unhealthy anger. For example, in verse 7, Joshua said, O Lord, our Lord, why did you bring us across the Jordan River just so the Amorites would destroy us? This wouldn't have happened if we would have agreed to just stay on the other side of the Jordan. Status quo starts to look pretty good. And now everybody's upset with Joshua and his leadership. So needless to say, Joshua's upset and he's got to find somebody to blame. So he's going to blame God. Why, God? Why did you let this happen to us? We were perfectly fine over on the other side of the Jordan. Why did you have to get us into this mess? Do you ever find yourself wanting to blame God when life doesn't go your way? If you aren't interested in God when things are going your way, then why would God be interested in you now? Ephesians 4, verse 26 and 27 says, If you're angry, don't let it become sin. Get over your anger before the day is finished. Do not let the devil start working in your life. That's the new, living, a new life version. This election has revealed a very dark side to the heart of many who claim to follow Christ. Their anger is out of control. Their temper tantrums are childish. Maybe the reason why we can't sleep at night doesn't have anything to do with the election. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that God doesn't want the devil to have access to our heart. That unresolved anger provides an open door of access for him into our heart. Bitterness allows all kinds of demons into our life. How do you make sense of all this? God uses the unexpected and the undesired events in life to help us overcome unhealthy anxiety as well. In chapter 7, verse 8 and 9 of Joshua, he says, I don't even know what to say to you since Israel's army has turned and run away from the enemy. Everyone, that, everyone will think that you weren't strong enough, God, to protect your people. Even Joshua is struggling with his faith. When he becomes the person in control, when he thinks he's the one in power, and life doesn't go like he thought it would or like he thought it should, he doesn't know what to make of it. And he doesn't know what to make about God. Paul would write to the Philippians and say this wisdom in Philippians 4 verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but instead in every situation, ask God for everything you need and always give him thanks. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. And his peace will guard your heart and your mind. As you live in Christ. Do you think that might be something that people need in their life right now? The peace of God that would guard their heart? The peace of mind that would keep them from going crazy? Because life is a mess in their opinion? Have you been more excited to share the latest tweet than the latest sermon series? Hmm. Maybe, just maybe, people that you know could use some encouragement right now about how to make sense of a mess. You see, God will also use the unexpected and undesired events in our life to help us overcome some unhealthy discouragement and depression as well. In Joshua 7 verse 9, it says, the Canaanites and everyone else who lives in the land will surely surround us and wipe us out. Joshua's just lost his mind now. He's just, he's just running wild like a kid that's been let out of school on the last day in springtime. You see, it was through divine intervention that God gave them freedom from Egypt. But Joshua's forgotten that. It was divine intervention that God fed them in the desert. But, God's for, but Joshua's forgotten that. Divine intervention guided them to the promised land. Joshua's forgotten that. Divine intervention divided the waters of the Red, uh, of the, uh, Red Sea and also the Jordan River. And they crossed over into the promised land on, on dry ground. And Joshua's forgotten that. 
And then the very first battle they had, the battle for Jericho, a fortified city, and the walls collapsed, and they, went, they walked through and claimed the city for their own. Joshua's forgotten that. And now, now, after just one loss, just one time, things didn't go the way he thought it should, and that was due to their own disobedience, he's concluded that God has abandoned us. What are we going to do now? The world's coming to an end. We're all going to die. We would never be ready to give up, would we? After just one election doesn't go our way. You see, one battle does not determine the final battle. But if they win, whoever they is, if they win, it'll be the end of our country. Well, I've got news for you. When God says we're done, we're going to be done. No matter who's in office. And if God doesn't think that it's time for the United States to be done, then it doesn't matter who's in office. We're not going to be done. How do you make sense of a mess? Of unexpected and undesired events in life? God will use them to help me grow up. It had to be frustrating for Joshua. He didn't run for this position. God laid it on his shoulders. God told him repeatedly, be strong and courageous. And now it feels like everything is out of control. You've got somebody who disobeys clear orders. Achan sins. The enemy wins. And all he can do is cry out to God. And what's God's response? In Joshua 7 verse 10. Probably the same thing that he would tell each one of us. Who feel like our life is a mess. The Lord said to Joshua. Get up. Why are you lying on your face like this? You see, sometimes God has to let us lose without him to teach us how to win with him. God reminds Joshua that he has a choice to make. He can either listen to his emotions, he can listen to his anger, he can listen to his anxiety, he can be overwhelmed by discouragement, or he can listen to God, he can worship God, and he can get up and get on with being obedient to God. Get up, he says in verse 13 of chapter 7, and tell the people of Israel, tomorrow you will meet with the Lord your God, so make yourselves acceptable to worship him. Next week, we'll take a look at what it takes to move on after we've failed spectacularly. But until then, just remember this. Every now and then, we need to ask ourselves, how do you make sense of this? And that's when it's important to remember God cares more about our character than the outcome. God will let us fail so that he can save us. God will use the messes in my life to expose what's holding me back. And God will use the mess in my life to help me grow up and grow on in glory to him. God bless you this week.